So if you were here last week, you remember the message on the shadow government. And if you were not here, I would highly, highly recommend you go to my YouTube channel, which is Apostle Ken, and listen to that message. It's very intense. Uh, it's very forthcoming. And, uh, and it, I, I wish all of you had listened to it before I get into this because I'm doing the defeated shadow government tonight. So this is part two of the shadow government. Uh, and defeating the shadow government, this is a defeated shadow government. Now, I need to give you a little background. I was, we were in the Florida Prayer Embassy, which is right down here in the corner. We'd love for you to come and pray with us this Tuesdays at 6, Wednesdays at 6, uh, Thursday, what time? 7, Fridays at 6, and then Wednesday morning we have a prayer gathering at 11.30 a.m., and you are welcome to come. It is not a kingdom gate thing. It is a Florida thing. And so we welcome people from across the state, and we do have them come from across the state to come and pray. So we were praying in there several weeks ago, and the Holy Spirit spoke a word to me of what we're dealing with here and across the land is a shadow government. I had never really heard Holy Spirit say those words. But when he said those words, it really resonated with me. And it re resonated with a lot of the people that were in that prayer gathering that day. That one of the things that we have dealt with here, we deal with it in Florida, we deal with it in the nation, is a shadow government. Now what a shadow government does, it does everything in its power to keep you from fulfilling the God destiny that the Lord has placed upon you. It doesn't have to be here. It can be in your home. It can be anywhere. I, as a matter of fact, you can be attacked by a shadow government anywhere you, you, you are. One of the things in talking about this tonight, let me share this with you. The moment that you say that person is a part of the shadow government, you've just defeated yourself rather than defeating the enemy. Because you can't begin to associate this demon that I'm talking about with individuals. However, individuals can be used by this shadow government if they submit to it. And it's easy to submit to it. Donald Trump had trouble his entire four years with a shadow government. You know, demons always say, and they say them through people sometimes. There he goes again talking about politics. I haven't begun yet to talk about them. You just wait till next year comes around. Next year comes around, I'll be dealing with it big time. But he was dealing with that all the time, and there's 1,700 employees at the White House. When I, look, when I started studying the shadow government, I, I said, let me see what he dealt with. So you had 1,700 employees that were being used, not all of them, but many were being used by the enemy to keep Trump from fulfilling the destiny that God placed upon him. I'm going to say something here. I'm not going to tell you who, who said this because I don't, they did not give me permission, but it, it's a well-known prophet. said this to me. When the China virus came out, they had, they had seen the China virus about eight months before it actually became public. And he said to me, he said, they will keep releasing this until they have their man in the White House. And it really grabbed me when he said that. Because that whole thing was to, you notice how quickly it left when he got out of office? It left very quickly. And uh, not that it wasn't real, it just was not continuing to be released. And so it's a shadow government that keeps, tries to keep you and I from fulfilling the destiny that the Lord has on us. And so when, when I was down in the Keys, Cheryl and I, we took a team with us. There's people here tonight that were on the team. And uh, when we were down in the Keys, on the way back, the Lord began sharing with me how... 
we can defeat the shadow government in our lives, in our church, in our family, in our state, and in our nation. And I intend at some point to do a lot of traveling to release the message that I released last week in several places in Florida, but especially in Washington, D.C. So if you go with me to Isaiah 22, 15 through 22, and we're going to read this again. And I, I, I read it every time I come on property. I read it today. Every time I get on property here, I read this because the way you defeat the enemy is not with flesh and blood, not with pointing out problems. The way you defeat the enemy is by taking the word of God and let that sound go into the atmosphere. This is what Jesus said. It is written. And he released that every time to the enemy. So here we go. Thus says the Lord God of hosts, Come, go to the steward, to Shebna, who is in charge of the royal household. What right do you have here? And whom do you have here? That you have hewn a tomb for yourself here. You who hew a tomb on the height, you who carve a resting place for yourself in the rock. Behold, the Lord is about to hurl you headlong, O man, and he is about to grasp you firmly and roll you tightly like a ball, to be cast into a vast country. And there you will die, and there your splendid chariots will be, you shame to your master's house. And I will depose you from your office, and I will pull you down from your station. Then it will come about in that day that I will summon my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, and I will clothe him with your tunic and tie your sash securely about him. I will entrust him with your authority, and he will become a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. Then I will set the key of the house of David on his shoulder. When he opens, no one will shut, and when he shuts, no one will open. One of the things I want you to see tonight is the shadow government is revealed to those who are, in, who are royalty. Let me say that again. The shadow government is assigned by Satan to those who are royalty, which means you. Every one of you here are royal ambassadors. You're royal sons and daughters of the living God. You are royal. Say, I am royal. We don't see ourselves as that very often. But the Bible teaches us that you are royal. And because you're royal, you have, Michael talked about it, the DNA of Christ on the inside of you makes you royalty. You are a, a relative of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. In 1 Peter 2, 9, it says, but you are a chosen race. I love this. So much for racism. Now, all of us, red, yellow, black, and white, are a chosen race. One race. One race. Every man under the sun came from one man. And that man, Adam. That makes us all kin. Look at somebody and say, we're kin. That makes us all kin. You're a chosen race. Look at this. A royal priesthood. You and I are royalty. We've been called to a royal priesthood. We've not been called to a priesthood that is earthly, sensual, or devilish. We are a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You have not received, you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. I want to read this to you out of the Passion Translation. But you are God's chosen treasure. I want you to say this with me. I am a chosen treasure. Start seeing yourself like royalty. 
I am a, a, a chosen treasure. I've been chosen by God. I didn't find him. He found me. I've been chosen by him. You're a chosen treasure. Priest who are kings. A spiritual nation set apart as God's devoted ones. He called you out of darkness to experience his marvelous light, and now he claims you as his very own. He did this so that you would broadcast his glorious wonders throughout the world. For at one time, you were not God's people, but now you are. At one time, you knew nothing of God's mercy, because you hadn't received it yet, but now you are drenched with the mercy of God. Say, I'm drenched with it. I love that. That mercy is just drenching me. I love this verse of scripture, or these scriptures here, because it really defines who we are. As we're being defined by the Lord, we have to remember now that there is a shadow government that we can't see in the natural that's working against you and I to keep us from fulfilling the divine destiny that God has placed upon us. That means that you and I are going to have to war to see God begin fulfilling what he plans to do. Another thing that Isaiah the prophet prophesied to Shebna and to Eliakim, but he said to him, he says, what right do you have here? Now, I love this, because the Lord is coming to an entity, a demonic shadow government in our nation, in our state, that's been attacking our church, attacking our people, and the Lord is saying to this demonic structure, what right do you have here? You see, Satan has no legal right to your life. He has no legal right to the earth. He has no legal right to this house. He has no legal right to this nation or to this state. Some people say, well, Satan has a legal right. No, he got it illegally. You need to hear that. He does not have a legal right because he is a liar. Jesus called him the father of lies. Tim Sheets said the Holy Spirit told him he was the forever loser. See, he's losing tonight. He's losing tonight. We serve in walking papers now. Pink slips. You see, Satan has no legal right here. He has no legal right to you, not to your house, not to your children, not to Florida or to this nation. Some have said the enemy has a legal right, but everything the forever loser possesses has been gained through lies. Jesus called him the father of lies, and in John chapter 8, verse 44, in the Passion Translation says, you are the offspring of your father, the devil, and you serve your father very well. Wow. Passionately carrying out his desires. He's been a murderer right from the start. He never stood with the truth. He's full of nothing but lies, lying in his native tongue. He is a master of deception and the father of lies. But I am the true prince who speaks nothing but the truth. Yet you refuse to believe me and you want nothing to do with me. If ever loser wants nothing to do with Jesus. So tonight we're going to do some treading. Jesus talked about in the New Testament, we'll read it in the moment, that we have an authority. And we have an authority to tread. Say tread. <clears throat> Would you let someone come in your home and ransack your home if you could do something about it? Well, I know, I know Cheryl wouldn't. Yeah, you, she's good to have on your side, I'm telling you. Years back, there was a person who came to our home, 
came inside and started cursing out our family. F and this and GD and this and this didn't. And there was a manifestation of demons. And I'm trying to get this person out the door. And so I'm just getting closer and closer to him, trying to edge him out the door, you know. And, and this person kept saying, don't touch me, don't touch me. If you touch me, I'm going to have you arrested. Well, Cheryl heard enough, and she touched her. <laughs> Cheryl grabbed her and threw her out the door. Yeah, exactly. Took her authority. Thank you. Thank you. You see, you don't allow that kind of stuff in your home. You don't allow that kind of thing to go home. You don't allow the en enemy to come into your house. To get him out of there, you have to begin treading the, uh, with the authority the Lord Jesus has given us. If you don't tread, he'll stay there. If we don't tread in Florida, if we don't tread in this house, if we don't tread in this nation, that shadow government's going to continue to work. And it's time that believers today begin rising up to tread within their society, within the sphere that God has placed them in. You rise up, you begin to tread. You rise up, you begin to walk on. You rise up and you begin to cast out in the name of Jesus Christ. You remove every oppressive spirit out of your sight in Jesus', Jesus name. <coughs> Thank you. So we're going to tread. The authority to tread has been given to every believer. The forever loser lies and can be put under your feet. In Luke 10, verse 17 through 19, it says the 70 returned with joy. And the reason they return is they had been sent out like the 12 had in Matthew 10. The 70 had been sent out. Jesus had brought 70 believers together, 70 people that he could impart the treading authority to, that he could place upon them a mantle to tread. They, they said... Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing, say nothing, Nothing will injure you. Same verse of scripture in the Passion Translation. When the 70 missionaries return to Jesus. I love this. I believe that I'm a missionary. We think of the term missionary as somebody overseas. But I know I'm a missionary. You know why? Because I'm a man on a mission. I'm a man on a mission. I am a missionary. Hallelujah. So are you. When the 70 missionaries returned to Jesus, they were ecstatic with joy, telling him, Lord, even the demons obeyed us when we commanded them in your name. Jesus replied, while you were ministering, I watched Satan topple until he fell suddenly from heaven like lightning to the ground. Now you understand that I have imparted to you my authority to trample over his kingdom. I'm going to show you another scripture. Go with me to Jeremiah chapter 1. I hadn't planned this one. You can just do it in the New American Standard, brother. Jeremiah 1. A lot of you didn't bring your Bible with you, so open your phone. Your tablet, your iPad. This is a new Bible, hardly been used, so it's challenging. <clears throat> this is what the Lord spoke to Jeremiah. Jeremiah 1, and we're going to be in verse 10. Let me back up a little bit. 
I'll back up a few verses before he gets there. Because this is a man who dealt with a shadow government. Verse 5. We'll go verse 5 through verse 10. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Every one of you here, before the Lord formed you in the womb, he knew you. You need to understand something. Every baby that's aborted, the Lord already knew that child. That's why we got to continue to save the babies. And abortion's still going on today. It's still rampant. And we've got to begin letting our voice be heard. We've also got to begin seeing redemption come to those who have had abortions. Forgiveness come to those who have had abortions. Because many of them are under guilt and condemnation many times because of the way that we preach against abortion. You need to understand that we're not talking about an individual, but we're talking about an act. We love anyone, even if they've had an abortion. I've got people in my life that over the years that I have prayed for who had abortions. I remember one pastor's daughter came to me. You remember this, Cheryl. And she was so distraught because she had gotten pregnant. Her parents didn't know it. And she got an abortion. But she was also distraught with shame and guilt because of doing that. And she came to me and she said, help me. I need to get free. And so we went through a time of forgiveness and repentance and deliverance to get her free. And now she's free from that. So it does happen. I have one of my spiritual daughters that lives in Orlando. Deanna is her name. She worked for Disney World. She had an abortion at an early age. And, uh, and she had that abortion because she was a Disney princess and she could not be pregnant and be a D Disney princess. And so she had that. But she's also gotten free from that. And she actually talks openly about it to people and on social media. You see... God wants you and I to understand that you are not an accident. You have been formed by God. And he says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I consecrated you. I have appointed you. Say, I have appointed you. Get this now. I have appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, alas, Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak because I am a youth. But the Lord said to me, do not say that. Do not say I am a youth, because everywhere I send you, you shall go. And all that I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. The Lord stretched out his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, behold, I have put my words in your mouth. Romans talks about these words and calls them the words of faith. He goes on to say there, verse 10, See, I have appointed you this day over the nations, over the kingdoms, to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. It's an important verse of Scripture when we're dealing with the shadow government. You see, you have been called to be a mouthpiece for the Lord. You've been called to be an oracle of God. It's not just reserved for a few special people. Each one of you here is called to be an oracle for the Lord Jesus Christ. Let him begin touching your life and let your words begin to speak the word of the Lord because he has appointed you this day over the nation and listen to this, over the shadow government. We're going to begin taking a dominion and authority. Like Cheryl said, I took my authority. We're going to begin doing that in this place, but also everywhere we go. When the Lord began downloading this to me, and I, I, I'm still thinking I'm supposed to do this, and I'm trying, to, I, I'm trying to hear the Lord, I really felt like God wants me to go to 22 cities in Florida and to release Isaiah 22, 15 through 22, and to the White House. Uh, sometime next year. I know I'll be going there. You see, authority here, where it talks about the authority, is exousia. And it's authority, it's jurisdiction, it's the power of rule or government. You see, the ecclesia 
is the government of God in the earth. Let me say that again. The ecclesia is the government of God in the earth. Now, an ecclesia is different than what we are right here, right now. Right here, we are right now a congregation. You become an ecclesia when you begin releasing the government of God through your words along with other people. You begin becoming an ecclesia that legislates the plans of God in the earth. It's a big difference. So you've got two things going on, and Jesus talked about both of them in Matthew 16 when he said, upon this rock I will build. The word build is oikos, just like the Greek yogurt. But it also means the household of God. So he was saying there, upon this rock, the revelation knowledge of Jesus I'm going to build a household. But this household is also going to be an ecclesia. I will build my church, say church. Greek word ecclesia. And just to give you a little information for you to study on, that word in the English church shouldn't even be there. Because it's the wrong word that King James put in. Because, and this is the reason, he, he knew what it was. He knew that it was the government of God in the earth, and he didn't want any other government in the earth except his. He didn't want to have to deal with any other government. So listen, he says, upon this rock I will build oikos, household, but also I will have a legislative body of believers. They will legislate and they will govern. And after he says ecclesia, everything after that, is governmental. We're up to the word household, it's revelation, it's family, but when he said the word ecclesia, everything in the rest of Matthew 16, 18, and 19 is about government. And he goes on to say that I will build my ecclesia and the gates of hell shall not prevail against them. It's actually a picture of the ecclesia storming the shadow government will not prevail against them. The gates of hell, say the gates of hell, has no chance. It goes on to say, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom. And whatever you bind on earth must have already been bound in heaven. That's the way the original Greek says it. Whatever you bind on earth must have already been bound in heaven. So what that means, I've got to get into heaven and hear what heaven's binding. Now back in the charismatic days, which I'm a product of, we bound everything we didn't like and we loosed everything we liked. How many of you remember those days? Binding and loosing. If we didn't like it, we bound it. If we liked it, we loosed it. We see a nice car going by, I loosed that car in my life. I've been, I've been loose in a Ford F-250, four-wheel drive, white, for several years now. Lord. So, so you, ha you can only bind what heaven has already bound. And you can only loose what heaven has already loosed. So you have to go into the heavens and hear what the Lord is binding and loosing. You see, exousia, authority, jurisdiction, root power of rule, or government. God wants you and I to be governmental believers. God say governmental. It's a compound word, which means to have a mind or a mentality to govern. Many of the church for too many centuries has had a mind to accept everything. And just think, well, that's the will of God. I'll never forget when Barack Obama was uh, elected into office in 2008. The day after he was elected, I had to do a conference in Orlando. I wept for the first 15 minutes. I couldn't even preach. Because I knew what this man stood for. And I knew that everything that God has taught, me, taught me to hate, this man embraced and loved. I also knew that God does not want that kind of man or woman 
in also. But it's up to you and I to pray them through, to vote them through in Jesus' name. Glory to God. We, it, governmental person, now let me share this with you. Because you can work in government and not be governmental. I know a lot of believers who said they have a governmental mantle because they're up in Tallahassee or they're in Washington, D.C. However, they do not have the anointing or the mantle that rules within the earth. So God, want, the governmental mantle is a mantle that rules anywhere, whether it's in Tallahassee, Washington, D.C., in this place, at Walmart, you learn how to rule everywhere you walk. It's called everywhere your feet treads upon, the Lord's given that to you. Wow. After 60 years, it's time for you and I to overcome. The shadow government has been at work. Psalms 23, verse 4, talks about walking through the valley of the shadow of death. I've walked around that shadow many times. We, and I'll eventually come to the place where I talk about God's shadow anointing. But many times I have been in that place where, the, where you're in that valley of a shadow. God has not called you to stay there. The word says that even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, what? I will fear no evil. There will be no fear upon me. Even though I'm walking in this valley, even though I know about this shadow government, even though Satan is threatening to kill me, I will not fear the evil works of the enemy. Last week after the message, we did a little harp and bowl here, and John Moss prayed a prayer last week that really blessed me and he talked about the shadow government that's been around here for 60 years going way back to the beginning of this house back when it was a baptist church back when a lot of people that were in here that were on the board were freemasons and so not all baptist churches are freemasons but many of them especially throughout the south have been freemasons and it doesn't mean that God can't move because all, we, all you do is kick Satan out and you just take over. Somebody told me a while back, said, I saw a snake at your church. And I said, is that the same snake that Eve and Adam dealt with? They didn't know how to answer that. See, these things don't go away. You just have to keep dealing with it. You have to keep putting it under your feet. You have to keep taking dominion over it in Jesus' name. They said, I never thought about that. And then I said, did you see the angels? Because I've seen angels here far more times than I've seen demons and snakes. The angels far outnumber the demons. Come on. Glory to God. I'm going to get a little personal with the house, and John has shared this, so I don't mind. He, I don't think he'd mind if I share it. John Moss, who's sitting back there on the, his royal throne. We love you, John Candy. John was fired by the former leadership, led by the former pastor, Larry Booth. And it was part of a shadow government working. Somebody says, hey, well, you shouldn't name names, and I understand that, but God didn't have a problem naming names. So I'm going to. John was fired by the former leadership, led by the former pastor, Larry Booth, and I've sat down and talked with John about his story. And, uh, and I believe that what took place among him was a part of a shadow government that was meant to overthrow the destiny that God has placed in him and the destiny that God has placed upon this house. Can I just mention briefly you? Our dear friend right here, Jackie, she was fired not long ago, maybe what, four or six months ago? Yeah. She was fired from being worship leader, part of the shadow government. And it was right here in this house with another church that meets here. And, uh, and 
Why they did it is beyond me. But it's all part of the shadow thing. So not only did Larry Booth try to fire, or did fire, John Moss and the church that meets here, fired this young lady here. The elders, back when Larry Booth was still here, they fired him. Now, Larry was sick. He was sick with cancer. He was going to die. But the elders ripped his family apart and this church apart because they removed him. Gave, he'd been here 29 years. Gave him, I think it was a $25,000 severance package. That's a peanut compared to working here 29 years and what you have to go through to deal with people for 29 years that many times you just grace, grace, God's grace. So the elders got into that shadow government and they fired Pastor Larry Booth. But before they did many years ago, about 20 years ago, a matter of fact, longer than that maybe, it was 2004, I remember now, Charlie was coming to visit us, and I was preaching in Coco, Friday Road Worship Center. Huh? Hurricane Charlie came to visit us, and I was preaching there. But before I got there, I was trying to find a worship team from this region to help me in the service that we were holding there. The people who were there at the time wanted some powerful worship, and I knew there was some in this area, but I was stopped in getting a worship team by the former pastor who used to be here. And he said to me, he said, you can't come into Brevard County without my permission. Shadow government. And... I got a little ticked off, and I said, well, you watch, because I'm coming. But I had to bring a worship team all the way from Winter Haven over here to lead the worship. Now, Cheryl and I were glad we were here because we got to avoid the hurricane as it came in and took our roof off of our house, and we were able to get a roof on two days prior to Francis coming to visit us, Hurricane Francis. I was blessed. I sure was. Now listen to this. Not only that, the elders of the tabernacle tried to fire Jamie Buckingham, and Jamie saw it and cut it off. That was told to me by his son. It was Bruce, isn't it? Bruce Buckingham told to me by him, and Jamie was able to get ahead of it. But listen to this, the elders, whenever Michael was, was set down because of his affair, and Michael is my neighbor, I saw him last night, and he, he talks about this openly. I've actually written articles uh, with, about ministers who fall into adultery. And I wrote it, and I put it on Facebook, and he actually commended the article. He said, having been one that has fallen into this, I urge all people to listen to these words and apply them to their life. So when Michael was set down, the elders at the tabernacle took over. They decided to run the church, but they had no pastoral gift. They had no apostolic gift, and now the church does not even exist today because they ran it in the ground. That's going to really go well in Brevard County. And, uh, but, you know, I'm at the point now where I don't really care what people think. I'm, I'm going to make some people mad. I had two demon-possessed men come after me down in the Keys. Let them all come. I will. I will. We've been mamby pamming around, walking on eggshells because we're afraid we're going to offend somebody. It's time to get off of your eggshells. It's time to be who God has called you to be. 
quit being a mamby-pamby believer and begin standing up with a backbone and be who God has called you to be in the name of Yeshua. All right. Not only that, but some over the years since I've been here have left here because they either felt or saw or experienced the control of the shadow government. You see, you and I need to not be ones who are leave, leave because things get hard. Somebody said to me a while back, they said, I had a dream that you were leaving. I said, well, unless God is speaking to me, I won't be going anywhere. And you hear it many times, I hear it many times from people, we, we're concerned that you're going to leave. I have never left anywhere because it was hard. I've always stayed because I've been cut out for the hardness. Paul told Timothy to endure hardness as a good soldier of the cross. See, you and I do not understand. We've been, we've been preached a gospel where everything is going to be okay. We've not been taught that you're going to go through trials. You're going to go through testings. You're going to go through tribulations. And you're to count it all joy when you fall into these divers' testings. That's what James says. James opens up and he says, Count it all joy, brethren, when you fall into divers. J James, James, would you please be quiet? He shouldn't have said that because it convicts me. It convicts me when I'm going through a hard time and I'm being challenged and, and I'm not in a good mood. And Cheryl can tell you I haven't been there in a while in a good, real good mood. I'm repenting, baby. I'm repenting. And I... <laughs> and you know, you're to count it all joy when the sound system back there messed up tonight. You know, they're working on it back there, and Colette calls me and says, hey, the soundboard's not working, and it's still not working. It's frozen. It's frozen where you can hear me, thankfully, and the people online can hear me. And then we all got together and prayed and Casting out demons, uh, I guess that soundboard demons or sound demons, are there such a thing as that, Jackie? <laughs> Casting out those demons, and, and as I walked away, I'm frustrated, I'm mad. I mean, just a few weeks ago, a cable, Mark found it, a cable had been pulled out, because and nothing was coming out of the speakers over here, and a cable had been removed, and so we've had that happen, we've had new AC had to put in, new roofs here and down there in the fellowship hall. And just like we've been under a large attack, but I remember the words of the Bible. I remember the words of Gerald Durstein. It says, in everything, give thanks. Not necessarily for everything, but in everything. While you're walking, when you're going through the valley of the shadow, you give thanks. When you're in Psalms 84, and you, and you walk through the valley of Baca, you make it a well. You give thanks that you're walking through that. You say, Lord, I'm thankful for where you've positioned me. I'm thankful for the church I'm in. I'm thankful for the city I'm in. I'm thankful for the family you've given me. I'm thankful for the children you've given me. I'm thankful for the spouse that you have given me. I really am, baby. Glory to God. So when John said, the 60-year reign is now defeated, something jumped up in my spirit. And it was Isaiah 60, verses 1 through 5. And it says here, Arise, shine, for your light has come. This is the way we need to start looking. We need to start looking biblically through the eyes of a biblical worldview, not the eyes of a fallen view, but the eyes of a biblical worldview. Arise and shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness will cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. But the Lord will rise upon you, and his glory will appear upon you. Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes round about and see they all gather together. They come to you. Your sons will come from afar, and your daughters will be carried in the arms. 
then you will see and be radiant, and your heart will thrill and rejoice because the abundance of the sea will be turned to you. The wealth of the nations will come to you. And when John said that, that's what I heard. It went off in me like an explosion. That when darkness arises, there is a remnant of people who arises with the light of God. They can go through anything as long as this light is shining. Maybe it's just a flicker. Even if it's just a flicker inside of you, you can go through anything with a flicker. But maybe you start speaking in tongues and praying in tongues and decreeing the Bible out loud. That flicker becomes a burning blaze on the inside of you. You see, you and I have been called to defeat this. I'm going to share with you several ways. All of them we're going to have to use to defeat this. I've got six ways to defeat this, and I'm going to try to go through very quickly. We have to become one body and one voice. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12 says, Two are better than one because they have good return for their labor. For if either of them falls, the one will lift up his companion. But woe to the one who falls when there is not another to lift him up. Furthermore, if two lie down together, they keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? And if one can overpower him who is alone, two can resist him. A cord of three strands is not quickly torn apart. Number one way that we're going to begin defeating this enemy is to become one voice. That's why I'm asking every one of you here tonight, when you step on the property, even if it's for a Friday night service, even if it's in the prayer rooms, I ask you tonight to begin decreeing Isaiah 22, 15 through 22, out loud over the property. Maybe God will call you to walk the property. It's been walked before, but maybe you haven't walked it. And maybe you're the one who will cause the bowls to tip over out of the heavens into the earth. Glory to God. Number two, to defeat this, is your tongue. You see, if we come in agreement with this, we come in agreement with everything that is wrong here, we're, we've become a part of the shadow of government. Proverbs 18, 21 says, that death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Whichever one you confess, if you confess death, you'll eat the fruit of death. If you confess life, you begin reaping the rewards of life. You begin reaping the bounty of life. I've had several people been bringing me some mangoes, and our neighbor has mangoes on their tree. Well, they don't have any more now because... I got a lot of them, and the squirrels got most of them. I didn't know squirrels like mangoes, but they absolutely love mangoes. And I love that fruit. I want to put a mango tree on the property here, several fruit trees. See, your tongue is very important. Not only your tongue, but as you operate in tongues, you've got to call it like Jesus decrees it. You got to use the word. You got to call it like he decrees it. That's why I, I still watch the news occasionally. I've not had it on at all today. And uh, I watch a whole lot less of it than I used to. But there's a reason for me. And I'm not saying you shouldn't because it's good to be informed. But I like for my faith to be in the word of God and not what a man has said. There's so many emotional things and word being de decreed by these uh, Fox prophets and CNN prophets, ABC, NBC, MSNBC prophets, all of those. Even have the Weather Channel prophets. They're, they're prophesying hurricanes right now. Weather Channel prophets. And Lord, let one start coming toward Florida. And then you have the church who jumps in with the Weather Channel prophets and they become a prophet momentarily. You have to call it like he decrees it, not like your flesh sees it. 
in Romans 4, 17 through 21. As it is written, a father of many nations have I made you. In the presence of him whom he believed, even God, who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist. In hope against hope, he believed, so that he might become a father of many nations. According to that which has been spoken, so shall your descendants be. Without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated his own body. Now as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. Yet with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully assured that what God had promised, he was able also to perform. You see, Abraham grabbed a hold of hope, and against hope, believed in hope. The hope of the natural tells you Abraham and Sarah can't have a son. But the hope that is of the kingdom of God says, oh, yes, they will. And every time, see, God, God had a plan whenever he changed his name from Abram to Abraham, God was calling those things that be not as though they are father of many nations. Every time somebody said, Abraham, Sarah said, Abraham, can you take out the garbage? She's saying, a father of many nations is taking out the garbage. Watch your words and your tongue because this is how we're going to defeat this enemy. We're not going to defeat it by flesh and blood. God has given us a strategy here to overcome. Next, number four. We have to begin operating as a team. We read it a moment ago. Jesus in Luke 10 says in verse 1, Now after this the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them in pairs ahead of him to every city and place where he himself was going to come. And he was saying to them, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest field. Number five, the teams are continued here. And the 70 return, we read it a moment ago. 70 return with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Listen to this. The shadow government that we've been dealing with for many, many decades now, six decades, this thing is subject to you and I. You get into negative talk, you become subject to it. But you start releasing the word of the Lord. You start decreeing Isaiah 22, 15 through 22. And all of a sudden, as you release that, the atmosphere begins changing. Things begin shifting. Paradigms begin, begin to be altered. As you and I release the word of the Lord. Just like blind Bartimaeus, as he was on the road there, he heard Jesus was coming. Jesus, son of David, have mercy upon me. And he said it again. Jesus, son of David, have mercy upon me. Every time he said that, he was altering his destiny. He had been a man who couldn't see because he asked the Lord to restore my sight. And he spoke that. Have mercy on me. Everything begins shifting. His destiny starts altering. And then the religious people said to him, Shh, be quiet. You shouldn't be talking like that. Don't trouble the master. But I love what Bartimaeus did. The Bible says he got louder. Instead of going the way of the denominational churches, the Presbyterians, the Methodists, the Baptists, a lot of charismatic churches today have gone seeker-friendly. It's time that you and I let our voice be lifted up high and say, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy upon me. And when the religious say, be quiet, you just go ahead and say it again, but you say it a little louder, just like the song, sing it a little louder. It's time to say it a little louder so that it's heard into the spirit realm 
and everything starts to be altered when that takes place. Glory to God. And every day I want to ask you to do this, especially when you're on the property here, but at your home also. It only takes five minutes for you to decree Isaiah 22, 15 through 22. I've been saying this for years, and I firmly believe it. Now, I'll, I'll put it to you this way. The majority of the word of faith people never have to go to counseling. And I'll tell you why. Because they decree the word of God out loud, daily. They speak the word of God out loud, daily. See, I know people go through things, but the way that you go through it with victory is you take the Word of God and you decree it out loud. You decree it so loud, and you just keep decreeing it, and you keep decreeing it, and you keep decreeing it. And then all of a sudden, it becomes a part of your life. 